Autobiography of Benvenuto Cellini, Part Two, Section Nine, Chapters Forty through Forty Four. Chapter Forty. Madame de Tomps, when she'd heard how well my affairs were going, redoubled her spite against me, saying in her own heart, "It is I who rule the world today, and a little fellow like that snaps his fingers at me." She put every iron into the fire which she could think of in order to stir up mischief against me. Now a certain man fell in her way who enjoyed a great fame as a distiller. He supplied her with perfumed waters, which were excellent for the complexion and hitherto unknown in France. This fellow she introduced to the king, who was much delighted by the process for distilling which he exhibited. While engaged in these experiments, the man begged his majesty to give him a tennis court I had in my castle. Together with some little apartments which he said I did not use, the good king, guessing who was at the bottom of the business, made no answer. But Madame de Tomps used those wiles with which women know so well to work on men, and very easily succeeded in her enterprise. For having taken the king at a moment of amorous weakness, to which he was much subject, she wheedled him into conceding what she wanted. The distiller came, accompanied by Treasurer Grolier, a very great nobleman of France, who spoke Italian excellently, and when he entered my castle, began to jest with me in that language. Watching his opportunity, he said, "In the king's name, I put this man here into possession of that tennis court, together with the lodgings that pertain to it." To this I answered, "The sacred king is lord of all things here. So then, you might have effected an entrance with more freedom." Coming thus with notaries and people of the court looks more like a fraud than the mandate of a powerful monarch. I assure you that before I carry my complaints before the king, I shall defend my right in the way His Majesty gave me orders two days since to do. I shall fling the man whom you have put upon me out of windows if I do not see a warrant under the king's own hand and seal. After the speech, the treasurer went off threatening and grumbling, and I remained doing the same. Without, however, beginning the attack at once, then I went to the notaries who had put the fellow in possession. I was well acquainted with them, and they gave me to understand that this was a formal proceeding done indeed to the king's orders, but which had not any great significance. If I had offered some trifling opposition, the fellow would not have installed himself as he had done. The formalities were acts and customs of the court, which did not concern obedience to the king. Consequently, if I succeeded in ousting him. I should have acted rightly, and I should not incur any risk. This hint was enough for me, and next morning I had recourse to arms. And though the job cost me some trouble, I enjoyed it. Each day that followed, I made an attack with stones, pikes, and arquebuses, firing, however, without ball. Nevertheless, I inspired such terror that no one dared to help my antagonist. Accordingly, when I noticed one day that his defence was feeble. I entered the house by force and expelled the fellow, turning all his goods and chattels into the street. Then I betook me to the king, and told him that I had done precisely as his majesty had ordered, by defending myself against every one who sought to hinder me in his service. The king laughed at the matter and made me out new letters patent to secure me from further molestation. Chapter Forty One. In the meantime, I brought my silver Jupiter to completion, together with its gilded pedestal, which I placed upon a wooden plinth that only showed a very little. Upon the plinth, I introduced four little round balls of hard wood, more than half hidden in their sockets, like the nut of a crossbow. They were so nicely arranged that a child could push the statue forward and backwards, or turn it round with ease. Having arranged it thus to my mind, I went with it to Fontainebleau, where the king was then residing. At that time, Bologna, of whom I have already said so much, had brought from Rome his statues and had cast them very carefully in bronze. I knew nothing about this, partly because he kept his doings very dark, and also because Fontainebleau is forty miles distant from Paris. On asking the king where he wanted me to set up my Jupiter, Madame de Tomps, who happened to be present, told him there was no place more appropriate than his own handsome gallery. This was, as we should say in Tuscany, a loggia, or more exactly, a large lobby. It ought indeed to be called a lobby because what we mean by loggia is open at one side. The hall was considerably longer than one hundred paces, decorated and very rich with pictures from the hand of that Admiral Rosso, our Florentine master. Among the pictures were arranged a great variety of sculptured works, partly in the round and partly in bas relief. The breadth was about twelve paces. 
Now Bologna had brought all his antiques into this gallery, wrought with great beauty in bronze. He had placed them in a handsome row upon their pedestals, and they were, as I have said, the choicest of the Roman antiquities. Into this same gallery I took my Jupiter, and when I saw that grand parade, so artfully planned, I said to myself, This is like running the gauntlet. Now may God assist me. I placed the statue, and having arranged it as well as I was able, waited for the coming of the king. The Jupiter was raising his thunderbolt with the right hand in the act to hurl it. His left hand held the globe of the world. Among the flames of the thunderbolt I had very cleverly introduced a torch of white wax. Now Madame de Tomps detained the king till nightfall, wishing to do one of two mischiefs, either to prevent his coming, or else to spoil the effect of my work by its being shown off after dark. But as God has promised to those who trust in him, it turned out exactly opposite to her calculations. For when night came, I set fire to the torch, which, standing higher than the head of Jupiter, shed light from above and showed the statue far better than by daytime. At length the king arrived. He was attended by his Madame de Tomps, his son the Dauphin and the Dauphiness, together with the King of Navarre, his brother-in-law, Madame Marguerite, his daughter, and several other great lords, who had been instructed by Madame de Tomps to speak against me. When the king appeared, I made my prentice Escanio push the Jupiter towards his majesty. As it moved smoothly forwards, my cunning in its turn was amply rewarded, for this gentle motion made the figure seem alive. The antiques were left in the background, and my work was the first to take the eye with pleasure. The king exclaimed at once, This is by far the finest thing that has ever been seen, and I, although I am an amateur and judge of art, could never have conceived the hundredth part of its beauty. The lords, whose cue it was to speak against me, now seemed as though they could not praise my masterpiece enough. Madame de Tomp said boldly, One would think you had no eyes. Don't you see all those fine bronzes from the antique behind there? In those consists the real distinction of this art, and not in that modern trumpery. Then the king advanced, and the others with him, after casting a glance at the bronzes, which were not shown to advantage from the lights being below them. He exclaimed, Whoever wanted to injure this man has done him a great service, for the comparison of these admirable statues demonstrates the immeasurable superiority of his work in beauty and in art. Benvenuto deserves to be made much of, for his performances do not merely rival, but surpass the antique. In reply to this, Madame de Tomps observed that my Jupiter would not make anything like so fine a show by daylight. Besides, one had to consider that I had put a veil upon my statue to conceal its faults. I had indeed flung a gauze veil with elegance and delicacy over a portion of my statue with the view of augmenting its majesty. This, when she had finished speaking, I lifted from beneath, uncovering the handsome genital members of the god, then tore the veil to pieces with vexation. She imagined I had disclosed those parts of the statue to insult her, the king noticed how angry she was while I was trying to force some words out in my fury, so he wisely spoke in his own language precisely as follows. Benvenuto, I forbid you to speak. Hold your tongue, and you shall have a thousand times more wealth than you desire. Not being allowed to speak, I writhed my body in a rage. This made her grumble with redoubled spite, and the king departed sooner than he would otherwise have done, calling aloud, however, to encourage me. I have brought from Italy the greatest man who ever lived, endowed with all the talents. Chapter 42 I left the Jupiter there, meaning to depart the next morning. Before I took horse, one thousand crowns were paid me, partly for my salary and partly on account of monies I had disbursed. Having received this sum, I returned with a light heart and satisfied to Paris. No sooner had I reached home and dined with married cheer, then I called for all my wardrobe, which included a great many suits of silk, choice furs, and also very fine cloth stuffs. From these I selected presents for my workpeople, giving each something according to his own desert, down to the servant girls and stable boys, in order to encourage them to aid me heartily. Being then refreshed in strength and spirit, I attacked the great statue of Mars, which I had set up solidly upon a frame of well-connected woodwork. Over this there lay a crust of plaster, about the eighth of a cubit in thickness, carefully modelled for the flesh of the Colossus. 
Lastly, I prepared a great number of molds in separate pieces to compose the figure, intending to dovetail them together in accordance with the rules of art, and this task involved no difficulty. I will not here omit to relate something which may serve to give a notion of the size of this great work, and, as at the same time, is highly comic. It must first be mentioned that I had forbidden all the men who lived at my cost to bring light women into my house or anywhere within the castle precincts upon this point of discipline i was extremely strict now my lad ascanio loved a very handsome girl who returned his passion one day she gave her mother the slip and came to see ascanio at night finding that she would not take her leave and being driven to his wits ends to conceal her like a person of resources he hit at last upon the plan of installing her inside the statue there in the head itself he made her up a place to sleep in this lodging she occupied some time and he used to bring her forth at whiles with secrecy at night i meanwhile having brought this part of the colossus almost to completion left it alone and indulged my vanity a bit by exposing it to sight it could indeed be seen by more than half paris the neighbors therefore took to climbing their house roofs and crowds came on purpose to enjoy the spectacle now there was a legend in the city that my castle had from olden times been haunted by a spirit though i never noticed anything to confirm this belief and folk in paris called it popularly by the name of limonio borio the girl while she sojourned in the statue's head could not prevent some of her movements to and fro from being perceptible through its eye-holes this made stupid people say that the ghost had got into the body of the figure and was setting its eyes in motion and its mouth as though it were able to talk many of them went away in terror others more incredulous came to observe the phenomenon and when they were unable to deny the flashing of the statue's eyes they too declared their credence in a spirit not guessing that there was a spirit in there and sound young flesh to boot chapter forty three all this while i was engaged in putting my door together with its several appurtenances as it is no part of my purpose to include in this autobiography such things as analysts record i have omitted the coming of the emperor with his great host and the king's mustering of his whole army at the time when these events took place his majesty sought my advice with regard to the instantaneous fortification of paris he came on purpose to my house and took me all round the city and when he found that i was prepared to fortify the town with expedition on a sound plan he gave express orders that all my suggestions should be carried out his admiral was directed to command the citizens to obey me under pain of his displeasure now the admiral had been appointed through madame de tomp's influence rather than from any proof of his ability for he was a man of little talent he bore the name of monsieur de annebault which in our tongue is monsignor de annebelle but the french pronounce it so that they usually made it sound like monsignor asino Biu this animal then referred to madame de tomps for advice upon the matter she ordered him to summon girolamo bellarmato without loss of time he was an engineer from siena at that time in dieppe which is rather more than a day's journey distant from the capital he came at once and set the work of fortification going on a very tedious method which made me throw the job up if the emperor had pushed forward at this time he might easily have taken paris people indeed said that when a treaty of peace was afterwards concluded madame de tomps who took more part in it than anybody else betrayed the king i shall pass this matter over without further words since it has nothing to do with the plan of my memoirs meanwhile i worked diligently at the door and finished the vase together with two other of middling size which i made of my own silver at the end of those great troubles the king came to take his ease a while in paris that accursed woman seemed born to be the ruin of the world i ought therefore to think myself of some account seeing she held me for her mortal enemy happening to speak one day with the good king about my matters she abused me to such an extent that he swore in order to appease her he would take no more heed of me thenceforward than if he had never set eyes upon my face these words were immediately brought me by a page of cardinal ferrara called il villa who said he had heard the king utter them i was infuriated to such a pitch that i dashed my tools across the room and all the things i was at work on made my arrangements to quit france 
and went upon the spot to find the king. When he had dined, I was shown into a room where I found his majesty in the company of a very few persons. After I had paid him the respects due to kings, he bowed his head with a gracious smile. This revived hope in me, so I drew nearer to his majesty, for they were showing him some things in my own line of art, and after we had talked a while about such matters, he asked if I had anything worth seeing at my house, and next inquired when I should like him to come. I replied that I had some pieces ready to show his majesty, if he pleased at once. He told me to go home, and he would come immediately. CHAPTER Forty Four. I went accordingly, and waited for the good king's visit, who, it seems, had gone meanwhile to take leave of Madame de Tomps. She asked whether he was bound, adding that she would accompany him, but when he informed her, she told him that she would not go, and begged him as a special favor not to go himself that day. She had to return to the charge more than twice before she shook the king's determination. However, he did not come to visit me that day. Next morning I went to his majesty at the same hour, and no sooner had he caught sight of me than he swore it was his intention to come to me upon the spot, going then, according to his wont, to take leave of his dear Madame de Tomps. This lady saw that all her influence had not been able to divert him from his purpose. So she began with that biting tongue of hers to say the worst of me that could be insinuated against the deadly enemy of this most worthy crown of France. The good king appeased her by replying that the sole object of his visit was to administer such a scolding as should make me tremble in my shoes. This he swore to do upon his honor. Then he came to my house, and I conducted him through the certain rooms upon the basement, where I had put the whole of my great door together. Upon beholding it the king was struck with stupefaction, and quite lost his cue for reprimanding me, as he had promised Madame de Tomps. Still he did not choose to go away without finding some opportunity for scolding, so he began in this wise. There is one most important matter, Benvenuto, which men of your sort, though full of talent, ought always to bear in mind. It is that you cannot bring your great gifts to light by your own strength alone. You show your greatness only through the opportunities we give you. Now, you ought to be a little more submissive, not so arrogant and headstrong. I remember that I gave you express orders to make me twelve silver statues, and this was all I wanted. You have chosen to execute a salt-cellar, and vases, and busts, and doors, and a heap of other things, which quite confound me when I consider how you have neglected my wishes and worked for the fulfillment of your own. If you mean to go on in this way, I shall presently let you understand what is my own method of procedure when I choose to have things done in my own way. I tell you, therefore, plainly, do your utmost to obey my commands, for if you stick to your own fancies, you will run your head against a wall." While he was uttering these words, his lords in waiting hung upon the king's lips. Seeing him shake his head, frown, and gesticulate, now with one hand and now with the other, the whole company of attendants, therefore, quaked with fear for me. But I stood firm, and let no breath of fear pass over me. End of section 9